I, I'm going to talk briefly about taxes, uh, which we were downtown talking to people about earlier today, and briefly about my book, and briefly about working to abolish war, and then hopefully uh, at length in response to questions. Um, uh, first of all, I, I can't necessarily see all of you in the back, it's so dark, but raise your hand if you enjoy paying taxes. <laughs> One, two. So, 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 so I am here to do a favor for the eight or nine of you. If you will see me afterwards, I'm going to let you pay part of my taxes. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the, the fact is, I mean, I understand the argument for the responsibility to pay taxes, uh, but the fact is that most Americans, beyond people in a lot of countries, really despise paying taxes, and I, I think there are a number of reasons. One is that, relatively speaking, you don't get anything back for them. There are places on this earth where you can pay taxes and get Guaranteed free education, preschool through college, guaranteed health care, retirement, vacation, decent uh, energy infrastructure, parks, uh, laws that require parental uh, leave and, uh, and uh, vacation leave and secure life. Uh, and in these places, there are longer lifespans and greater happiness and greater security from not having to struggle. And I can imagine living in such a place and paying taxes and really appreciating paying taxes. Another reason is that in this country, people increasingly are aware that billionaires and corporations are paying taxes at a lower rate than they are, uh, including many corporations that are paying nothing. Uh, in taxes. Uh, so there's incredible resentment. And because we've been taught to praise the billionaires for their so-called success, even if they cheat to get there, all the resentment goes to the IRS, you know. Um, but I think the third reason that people are perhaps a little less aware of and a little less conscious of is that taxes were created for a reason. And it was supposed to be temporary. And it was supposed to go away. And the reason was war. And taxes were not created in this country until there were big wars. Uh, and they were not created for most working people for most of those wars. They were created for the corporations and the wealthy and the war profiteers. They were created for the War of 1812, and then they went away. And then they were created for the, for the First World War, and then they went away. Uh, they, the, the income tax didn't show up until the Civil War where it showed up on both sides of the Civil War, but then it went away. But it was an income tax for people with huge incomes. Uh, you didn't get taxation of ordinary people, of most Americans, until World War II, uh, during which a Disney cartoon informed Donald Duck that you must pay taxes to defeat the Axis. And Irving Berlin wrote a song that said, you see those bombers in the sky, Rockefeller paid for them, and so did I. And, and, and taxes were called the victory tax, right? And all of that was supposed to go away and never did. Just like you were supposed to stop occupying Germany and Japan someday, and you were supposed to stop building masses of weapons and conquering new territories and putting new ships in new waters and dominating the globe someday, and it never happened. I mean, World War II is still going on, and one of the ways in which it's still going on is taxes. Um, so people in the city of Seattle are going to send about $4 billion to Washington, D.C., just for the Department of So-Called Defense just this year, and then another pile next year. It doesn't count so-called Homeland Security, doesn't count... Uh, nukes in the energy department, mercenaries in the state department, the state department itself as a marketing firm for weaponry, the, uh, the veterans care, all the rest of it. So many billions of dollars and you don't get much for it except for death and suffering and hatred of this country in a number of foreign countries. Um, the, uh, the book that 
is for sale is called War is a Lie, and it's meant to be a handbook to prepare people to recognize war lies when they see them so that they don't have to wait decades for papers to come out and Freedom of Information Act requests to be answered and to find out that a war was based on lies, that we recognize them when we see them. Uh, and so it looks at types of lies, lies that wars are defensive, for example, wars like the vicious aggression against Iraq in 2003 are sold as defensive. Um, it looks at wars that are marketed as humanitarian, which is a relatively new way, but, of, but almost universally applied to all wars now that they are in some way humanitarian. So you pretend that Gaddafi is threatening to massacre civilians, which he wasn't. You get a UN authorization to protect them. Uh, you go in and bomb the capital and overthrow the government and create disaster and proliferate weapons around the region uh, and very quickly forget about the so-called humanitarian mission of protecting the civilians because you've moved on to the follow-through of punishing the wrongdoer who was going to massacre the civilians. And uh, so there actually has not yet been a humanitarian war that benefited humanity, but it, there is this relatively new marketing scheme for wars. Uh, in the book, I, I, look, so I look at numerous types of lies that are used to start wars, continue wars, make wars seem better after the fact, escalate wars. Uh, and I look more than at any other war at the wars that people tend to say are the good ones. And of course, World War II more than any other. Um, and if you want, we can talk about all the reasons that World War II was not a good war. Um, but the, the U.S. government understands more than history teachers, I think, the, the value of maintaining the lies and inventing new lies about long past wars. So President Obama is the first president who has declared the war in Korea a success. You know, after decades of it being a, a, a futile, stupid draw, they have, the, the Pentagon has a, a multi-million dollar program now to tell lies and, and exaggerations and beautify the war in Vietnam. And Veterans for Peace is doing a wonderful job of countering some of that, and they've got a, a, a paper out on the table here. Um, they're building a World War I monument in Washington, D.C., of all the stupid wars you can make monuments to. Um, and so then in the book, I also look at actual motives, right? So if the wars weren't really to defeat ultimate evil and defend ourselves and protect the, the civilians and enforce the rule of law and be the global policeman and uh, support the troops. You know, once the war is going, it's for the benefit of the soldiers sent to it to support the troops and continue the war, which by the way, has not shown up once in a single private email from Hillary Clinton. Uh, it's, you know, shows up only in public justifications for wars. Uh, there, there are, you know, beyond all those claims of what the wars are for, there are actual motivations of what wars are for, uh, some rational, some less so, including profits, including uh, geopolitics, including domination and revenge and punitiveness and, and so forth. And so I look at these types of common motivations that actually seem to justify wars. Um, and, and we've seen this put to the test in recent years since I wrote the first edition of this book. In 2013, uh, as revealed by Seymour Hersh later, President Obama had committed himself to a massive bombing campaign of Syria and had promised John McCain and other senators on the Hill that this was going to happen. Northrop Grumman understood it was going to happen and was making more missiles as fast as it could and its profits were through the roof record high, uh, every media outlet, the leadership of both of the big political parties said these missiles are going to hit Syria. And there was a serious push in the media by President Obama and Secretary Kerry with the president saying, go look at YouTubes on your computer of children being poisoned by chemical weapons in Syria. And we know for a fact, we won't show you the evidence, but we know for a fact that Bashar al-Assad did this. And of course, they didn't have any evidence, and they still don't, and we don't know who did it, uh, but we do know that it was in the middle of a war in which men, women, and children were being killed by all sides with all kinds of weapons. Uh, and the idea that this one particular type of weapon was a reason 
for a major escalation in the war was a little too close to Iraq 2003. Uh, and the threat to Syrians wasn't quite the same as a threat to Americans, uh, which is really what generates support for wars among Americans. Uh, and, and so you had, you had Jewish holidays, APAC out of town, you had Congress members on leave and speaking at town hall events like this one and being questioned, why should we get in a war on the side of Al-Qaeda? And you had the House of Commons, moved by the British public, say no to a prime minister on war for the first time since Yorktown. And, and you had enough public pressure build up, more phone calls, more emails, more visits than anything ever, banker bailouts, wars, peace, anything. But fundamentally, it was a question of the previous 10 years of having made Iraq a badge of shame and Hillary Clinton having been unable to win a primary, having voted for that war. Why she hasn't lost this one yet, I don't know. But, but the, 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 the movement that drove so many countries to oppose the war on Iraq and made it illegal at the UN and allowed us to protest it as a criminal enterprise rather than a humanitarian movement for, for the previous decade, made Congress members say, I don't want to be that jerk who votes for another Iraq. And Obama, as he admitted in the, in the article in The Atlantic recently, reversed his decision and shocked all of his staff and so forth, which is the last thing they ever want to admit, that we had any sort of impact, which we do all the time, but they don't want to admit it. Um, and a year later, the public having stood up against war lies and said, no, we don't want this. And the Congress and the administration having gone ahead with arming proxies and training forces uh, and moved very, very little on any major actual aid campaign or diplomacy or ceasefire or disarmament agreement, uh, you know, everything having worsened, uh, you know, and, and President Obama having asked the CIA for a report, has arming proxies ever worked? And they having said, well, no, and except for that time in Afghanistan, but there was a little bit of blowback. And, uh, and President Obama having said, okay, and gone ahead with arming proxies in Syria, and everything having gotten worse, the people who probably would have been put in charge of Syria had that bombing campaign happened, which Hillary Clinton to this day says it should have, and Obama was wrong to call it off, in other words, ISIS, put out these videos of white people and knives, and everybody lost their minds. And now the president wanted to get in the war on the opposite side from what you had a moral responsibility to get in the war on the previous year, plus the same side too. We're going to get in on both sides, actually. And it made no sense whatsoever. And everybody said, oh, okay, oh, okay, because of the power of fear. And now you have the State Department last week, or maybe it's a week and a half ago now, a State Department spokesman, you can go watch the video, being asked uh, by a reporter, do you want Syria to retake the town of Palmyra or do you want ISIS to hold on to it? And the guy refusing to answer and ultimately saying, you know, I don't want ISIS to be weakened in any way if it, if the, if it strengthens Syria. Because the, the, the priority among the enemy list for the US government remains the Syrian government, which they have managed to scare about three Americans of. The priority among the American public that's got them so scared they can barely think is ISIS. Right? And so you, you have to, so everybody imagines the government has the same priorities, but their priority is, is very different. Uh, and so they've been arming Al Qaeda in Syria for years now, uh, in, intentionally and knowingly and directly and indirectly. Uh, and the public, you know, has no idea. You now have forces armed by the CIA in Syria fighting forces armed by the Pentagon in Syria. Right? I mean, this isn't just. Yemen or Libya or Afghanistan or any of the endless wars where you have U.S. weapons on both sides. You have U.S. trained and armed people on both sides, right? I mean, it's absolute madness. Now, Hillary Clinton wants a no-fly zone because someday ISIS might develop the airplane, you know. But, <laughs> but, the, government, but the government is now talking about giving their fighters on the ground in Syria anti-aircraft weaponry. 
And I was just talking with someone who lives near Boeing out here about all the talk about all the planes, the U.S. planes that need to go over to Syria. Does anybody remember what George W. Bush said to Tony Blair on January 31st, 2003, right before they held a press conference about how they were trying to avoid war in Iraq? One of his schemes for how they could start a war in Iraq? He said, let's paint some planes with UN colors and fly them low and see if we can get them shot at. Right? So why, why give anti-aircraft weaponry to people on the ground in Syria? And what happens when they do shoot down an airplane? So work to be done uh, in that uh, theater, if I may use the term. Uh, in, in, in Iran, the peace movement has been stopping an attack on Iran for so many years that we now have a very strong argument that says every time they bring up we need to urgently attack Iran, why, when you've been saying that for years and we haven't done it yet, can't we wait a few more years? Because we stopped it in 2007, we stopped it in 2015 against all the lobbying efforts of, of billionaires and APAC uh, and the demand for, for war. But stopped it in a possibly Pyrrhic victory because both sides, you know, were telling the U.S. public the Iranians are trying to build nuclear weapons and they want to kill us. Therefore, one side said, we must attack them, or therefore, the other side said, we must establish this agreement and have good inspections and so forth. But both sides lying, uh, and the public left in a worse place than before, um, except for the fact that the war has been held off for yet another year, uh, and the longer it's held off, the more the claims of urgency, which is one of the standard lies with every war, it's urgent. Because if you don't do it urgently, somebody might think of something else you might do. You know, if you have to attack Iraq because if you give the inspectors another week, they might swear there are no weapons. The, the, the urgency doesn't hold up with Iran because we keep stopping it. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of these uh, events now the past week or two, and I, and I asked this question uh, last night in Bellingham, and nobody could do it. I bet somebody here can do it. Raise your hand if you can name the seven nations that our current president has bragged about bombing. Right here, front row, perfect, I can see you. Yeah, Yemen is one of them, Somalia is one of them, Libya is one of them, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. Yeah, did I count seven? No, not seven. Six. Six. That was very... That, that was the part of Pakistan. You got it. You got it. The, the United States is the only country on earth that cannot keep track of its wars. The only country. Uh, I mean, it's unheard of. I mean, the Roman Empire could keep track of its wars. Uh, the, the, the United States is the only country on earth where a presidential candidate is asked, are you willing to kill innocent children by the thousands to be commander in chief? As if that's the responsibility of being commander in chief. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing about that last one, Pakistan, there's a man from Pakistan who they have tried to kill, the White House has tried to kill with missile strikes from drones four times and failed, and he's now gone to London to ask if he can be taken off the lists. And then he's gonna go back to Pakistan, and then they're gonna keep trying to kill him. And President Obama says that he will only kill people if they can't possibly be arrested. We don't know of a single case in reality where that's been true. Uh, we know of many where it's demonstrably false. Uh, where they have been identified and we know who they are. Not true of most drone victims. Uh, where they are an imminent threat to the United States. Not true of a, an imminent and continuing threat, which doesn't even exist in logic, uh, but, it, but uh, to the United States. But, uh, you know, not a single case, of course, in reality. Uh, you know, there's, there's one case where most of these conditions have been met, and these are all just 
random conditions that the president has imposed on himself while committing murder. They're not laws. Uh, but there's one case where almost all of them have been met, and it's a movie called Eye in the Sky, uh, where they invent a fantasy where all of these conditions have, where, you know, they know who they are, they can't possibly get at them, and they are about to kill people. They aren't about to kill the United States, which, you know, because the movie is set in Africa. But otherwise, it comes very close. But it's a fantasy. It's not reality. Uh, and everything that people think about drones uh, is a pack of lies. Uh, and when people come up to you, as they have to me, and say, I prefer drones because with drones nobody gets killed, they, they are erasing 96% of humanity from the earth, uh, which is you know, a, a, a significant way in which we're lied to about wars. Who, who counts? You know, who counts as a nobody? Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about Yemen, which I think uh, you named early on there, uh, is that when Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, was deciding to waive all the restrictions on selling the airplanes to Yemen, uh, to Saudi Arabia, with which to bomb Yemen, and as they are now doing, bombing Yemen with U.S. weapons uh, and the active support of the U.S. military, a company called Boeing gave $900,000 to a foundation called the Clinton Family Foundation. Uh, and Boeing needs to be shamed for that. Uh, Saudi Arabia, as it happened, had already given the Clinton Family Foundation over $10 million. Uh, Hillary Clinton and the Saudi Royalty need to be shamed about that. But this is the level of corruption that we're up against uh, in, in trying to stop wars, and we still are able to do it. Um, but, but when you hear people talk about a company like Boeing, they talk about it as a jobs program. And we wouldn't want to eliminate jobs. We wouldn't want, uh, uh, Madam Senator, we wouldn't want you to lose those jobs, would we? You know, th this is how it's talked about in public, I mean, it, which sounds sociopathic if you're living among that other 96% of humanity, that you would kill people for jobs. And it doesn't even make economic sense because you can convert to peaceful jobs uh, and benefit economically. Uh, so we, we, we have layer upon layer of, of corruption, uh, on top of which we have all of the lies that support this, this empire. We, you watch the Super Bowl and they thank the troops for watching from 175 countries and nobody blinks and nobody goes and looks at which countries are still missing from the list and they're the ones that are the evil threats to, uh, to stability and peace in the world. You know, they're Iran and Syria and our, 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 our Veterans for Peace hero, Smedley Butler, said that the United States military should stay within 200 miles of the United States, which would work wonders and cut 90% of military spending. Our current Secretary of so-called Defense, they don't call it war anymore, is on his way to, uh, to go take a little cruise on an aircraft carrier in the China Sea, where China and the United States slash Philippines are disputing a bunch of rocks in the water, uh, and where Chinese island construction and Chinese ship sailing in the China Sea, which is named that for a reason, is considered a threat to the United States and an act of aggression by China. You know, it, it, it's madness. Um, it's it's. It's madness that's, that's out in the open, that's not, that's not secret anymore, and assassinations are not secret anymore. It's, it's you know, a, a drone program that the president signs off on every Tuesday. Um, so it, it, it's very important for us to recognize what's happening with current wars. It's also just as important for us to, to tear down the myths about the past wars, about the idea that we needed a revolution, uh, that somehow we're better off than Canada, which hasn't had it yet, that we need, that you couldn't end slavery without a war, even though other countries ended slavery without a war, that the Civil War wasn't, a, that the revolution wasn't about westward empire, that the Civil War wasn't about westward empire, the North and the South could have agreed. If they hadn't both agreed, they were expanding and disagreed about what was gonna be slave and free in the new land. Um, the, you know, every war has been based on a pile of lies. I had people treat, I heard many people treat the Iraq war in 2003 as somehow unique. Uh, and the, the Spanish-American war was, was based on lies. Spain wanted to 
go to arbitration and prove they had nothing to do with blowing up the ship in Cuba, and the United States wanted a war. President Wilson and President Roosevelt told the lies about U.S. ships being innocently attacked by Germany when they were ships that were helping British airplanes, when, they were, when the United States went out of its way to provoke Japan, when, the, when Jewish refugees were turned away and ships within sight of Miami were chased off by the Coast Guard, uh, a war that, you know, in World War II that had nothing to do with saving the Jews or other victims of the camps until after the war was over, uh, except for peace activists who were trying uh, to get those people out of there and to end the war before more were killed, uh, and, and a war which killed 50 or to 70 million people, not just nine million people in camps. Uh, John Kerry was just over in Hiroshima not to apologize but to maintain the pretense that there was some justification for dropping nuclear bombs on cities. When there wasn't, there's no dispute, there wasn't, and they knew it. Uh, and now the United States is building what they call smaller, more usable nuclear weapons. And the other eight nuclear countries are all building new nuclear weapons. And there is a growing movement to ban nuclear weapons. And there's legislation I just saw today in the Netherlands to ban the nuclear weapons from and get them out of that country, which Scotland was about to do if it got independence. Uh, there, you know, there is a movement going in both directions uh, on nuclear weapons, and it matters very much <laughs> who wins. Um, there is also a growing movement to end all war. Uh, and this is, this is what I've been working on with a project called World Beyond War. Uh, there's a clipboard that Dan has that if he can pass around, if you're so inclined to sign, it's a very short statement at the top uh, that has been signed by people in 133 countries and growing um, that says, I want to help end all wars. Um, we've got a, a, a video I'm going to put out next week from Archbishop Desmond Tutu explaining his support for this and promoting a, a conference that we're planning in, in September. Um, but this is a, a movement that is growing worldwide that is, you know, seeking to put an end to the idea that we need to distinguish the bad wars from the good wars any more than we distinguish bad rape from good rape or bad child abuse from good child abuse, that, that war is always bad and to tear down the arguments that are you know, much more prominent in this country than in most places, that war is inevitable and natural. The fact is that at least 90% of people on earth are represented by governments that put radically less into wars and militarism than this one, in, in many cases none, nothing. 99% uh, of people in the United States and more have nothing to do with participating in wars and, and want nothing to, you know. 44% I think in a poll of, of Americans said they would participate in a war. Well, what's stopping them? You know, we got more wars than we can count. They don't actually want, they want to think of themselves as participating in wars. There is not yet a single case of post-traumatic stress disorder from war deprivation. There is every, the, the top killer of U.S. troops is suicide after they come home. Right? The idea that there's something natural or inevitable about this is just sheer madness. Uh, so we're, we, we've created this organization to try to nudge the peace movement uh, in the direction of talking about ending particular wars as models for ending all wars and stop saying things like, let's end this war so we're more prepared for better wars or let's, let's stop the wasteful weapons that don't work. I love the wasteful weapons that don't work. I, you know, I, I want to stop the efficient weapons that kill, uh, and, and you know, let's talk about it as abolition of war and not as you know, just opposition to particular little bits, and let's make it global, and let's work with other countries, the people in Okinawa who have just stopped a base for the moment, let's support them, let's go after Ambassador Kennedy and President Obama and, and make that stick and close the other bases there too, um, and, and let's build a bigger coalition the top destroyer of the natural environment is something that the biggest environmental groups will not touch. The top consumer of petroleum on Earth is the United States military. It would rank number 30-something in a list of nations if it were a nation. It is the third biggest polluter of U.S. waterways. It is the top creator of Superfund disaster sites. It is you know, about an hour of a military jet 
is equivalent to you driving your car around all year. I mean, this is the scale of the destruction uh, of the natural environment. N never mind the landmines and the depleted uranium and the burn pits and the white phosphorus and the nation of Iraq that it has been destroyed permanently will never recover. It, it, this is an environmental issue. And the money that is desperately needed to protect the environment is all being dumped into war unless we were gonna start taxing billionaires and corporations. So it's the civil liberties groups that go after torture and assassination and so forth, but not the military spending that creates it. The, the groups that are going after racism to a greater extent are also willing to go after the militarism that creates the racism about groups abroad that comes back home. Um, but it's also, it, it, it's also a question of the dollars. I mean, the top way that war kills is not any weapon, but it's by moving the dollars. Tens of billions could end starvation. Drink, clean drinking water, uh, green energy, infrastructure, education, in this country and abroad. A trillion dollars, a trillion dollars a year just from the United States on this criminal enterprise. We, uh, we ha I encourage you to go to worldbeyondwar.org uh, uh, to sign your name there if you don't get the clipboard and to, to check out the arguments and give me feedback on what we should improve in the resources there. But we've just set up a contest there where you can help the United States Air Force name its new bomber and they, they, because they created a contest but you had to be in the Air Force. So we wanted everybody to get a chance and I cannot uh, decently repeat some of the names that, that people have, but you can read over five or six hundred names at this point that have been suggested. Um, and, and also, uh, probably next week or soon, we will have information about a big conference we're going to have in September on alternatives to war uh, in Washington, D.C., but we're going to be giving people the tools to do similar events everywhere else. Um, and uh, one of the many, many speakers already lined up for that is former Congressman Kucinich. So uh, we will be looking forward to, uh, to seeing him. A and I would uh, love to answer as many questions as I can. And thank you very, very much for coming out. Have you been uh, hailed by the US government or harassed or followed or uh, not in any significant way that I'm aware of, although I wouldn't know, probably. Um, I will say that on one occasion I was going to a peace rally in New York City uh, on an Amtrak train and I was online uh, emailing with the organizers at the rally in New York City while I was on the way. And when I got there, some of the police officers came up to me and the other people I was talking to in person at that point and started making very clear that they had been reading those emails. Uh, and uh, I think that was intended to be disturbing. It didn't really bother me much. Uh, just quickly, um, Boeing sells about a billion dollars worth of drones a year. Is that your understanding? I don't know how, many, how much uh, Boeing sells of drones. But I, I, I do know that Boeing sells mil billions and billions of dollars of, of weaponry every year and could uh, do just as well economically and for its employees, if not much better, if it switched over to peaceful airplanes or more peaceful windmills or other things that it could produce. You touched on this a couple times in your opening remarks whether or not there is a good war. And, and I frame this in the context when I'm talking with people. They always bring up Hitler, Rwanda, where we should have had our military and saved perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives. So I'm a little, I'm not adequately prepared to answer that question. Well, those are questions that I answer at length in my books. I'll try to answer them briefly here. Uh, World War II I touch on uh, quite a lot in War is a Lie. Uh, Rwanda more so in a more recent shorter book, I mean more recent than the first edition of War is a Lie, uh, called War No More. But, you know, I mean, the, the very brief version on Rwanda is why do you ignore the U.S. military support and arms and engagement with war-making warmongers in Uganda for the previous three years, support for their assassination of the president of Rwanda and the neighboring country, uh, and, and then refusing to uh, support any 
uh, UN intervention of any sort uh, when there was a slaughter going on that was going to put those warmongers in power in Rwanda where they stay and the ongoing support for them taking the war making over into Congo to continue what has become uh, the worst war since World War II, six million people dead. And why do we say not another Rwanda so much and not another Congo never? Uh, and, and why, you know, why do we love to make this distinction between a genocide, which is a war made by somebody else in Africa, and a war, which is a war made by the United States to prevent a genocide? Uh, the, the fact is that, that war creates genocide. They're close cousins. That's, you have to squint very hard to see the difference. And the militarism created the Rwandan disaster. And yes, it would have, once you'd created that disaster, uh, it would have been nice to send in some humanitarian aid, to send in some, uh, some armed or unarmed peace workers, police force. But the idea that bombing Rwanda at that point would have helped anything is just insane. And so when people th bring up Rwanda in the same breath as we must bomb Libya or we must bomb Syria, I mean, they're, they're, they're not being honest at all. When Samantha Power says, stop looking at what happened to Libya so you will be willing enough to bomb Syria, she's being very honest, you know, because when you look at what happens, you don't support the next one. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to give a short answer on World War II. I mean, part of it is if you have to go back 70 years to find a legitimate example of what has been the biggest public project of our culture for the past 70 years. Something is crazy. We don't do that for anything else. Uh, and you're going back to a world that is radically different, completely different types of colonialism and empire and military and wars. Uh, and, and to draw lessons from then to now is, is quite a stretch. But then to refuse to go back 80 or 90 years, to refuse to say, why did World War I have to be ended in a manner that many wise people predicted on the spot would create World War II, almost down to the date in some cases? And why did Wall Street have to go on funding the Nazis for decades as preferable to the communists? And why, why all the bad steps leading up to World War II? And then once you got to World War II, why the pretense by the United States that it was threatened? Why Roosevelt with the forged map of the Nazi plans to carve up South America, with the forged Nazi plan to eliminate religion from the world, and all of the lies, and the provocations of Japan fulfilling the promise to, to Churchill, and Roosevelt drafting a declaration of war against both Japan and Germany on the night of Pearl Harbor and being talked out of Germany. Uh, you know, and then to take the very worst thing that has ever happened in the world, in any short period of time and claim that it's somehow justified by something else because of the evil of one party to it when you know most of the nations involved killed more innocent people than were killed in those camps. Germany killed more innocent people outside of the camps than in the camps. The United States killed more innocent people outside of the camps than the Nazis killed in the camps and so forth. You know, the, the United States cared the government, not lots of good people, a minority, but lots of good people cared, but the government cared not a damn for the Jews or the other victims of the Nazis in the years leading up and during the war. Not a single diplomatic effort or military effort to save those people. It wasn't about that at all. You know, it, it, it was, it, it had nothing to do with what we think of as justifying it these many years later. As humani the myths about humanitarian war have overtaken the myths about defensive war, so that people will defend World War II because it was to save the Jews, when it wasn't. You know, it, it, it wasn't. It had nothing to do with it. Uh, and you had peace activists in the 30s and on, marching in the streets in this country against the provocations of Japan and demanding that, that the, the Jewish people be saved from the Nazis. And the, the nations of the West meeting in Geneva and deciding not to accept the Jews, I mean, the Nazis wanted to send them all out, not kill them all, which is insane, but better, uh, and nobody would take them. Uh, and so, you know, the, the idea that, that somehow 
World War II was justifiable as necessary or good or proper when it gave us all-out war on civilians, when the United States up to and during World War II and after engaged in eugenics and human experimentation and slaughter of civilians and, and, and uh, gratuitous nuking of cities. You know, it, it just... It, 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 it just doesn't hold up. Uh, and if it did, it, doesn't, it, it isn't relevant to going forward in 2016 when we know so much about the power of nonviolent activism that those people didn't know. And when the women went in the streets in Rosenstrasse in Berlin and said, let our husbands out, and the Nazis let them out because other people were starting to join the movement, and then they won that little victory and went home, they needed to escalate, you know? And where there was nonviolent resistance to the Nazi orders to, to, uh, to, to put the Jews on trains in Eastern Europe and in Scandinavia and elsewhere, it was remarkably successful. And where the Danes and the, and the Norwegians refused to comply, it was successful. And we know now that nonviolence tends to be more successful. Um, so the idea that the United States needs to maintain the military that Eisenhower accur accurately predicted would create all these wars and kill all these millions of people in case Hitler is reborn and comes to get us. It is just paranoia and projection of, of the worst sort. Yeah. Well, I, I actually got somehow not confused, but every time you mentioned we need to save the Jews from the Nazis. I wonder, oh, do we need now to save the Palestinians? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, building monuments and uh, reminding everybody about their suffering, uh, except they themselves uh, who are not remembering that they are causing the same suffering to other people. Yeah? Uh, anyways, I appreciate all what you said, but I am kind of a, a realist, a realist person. Uh, frankly, I feel that war has become a part of the American culture. Like I can't imagine actually the American culture itself without a war. Now, you go to any arcade, in any uh, movie theater, or shopping mall, and you find kids enjoying shooting and killing. Uh, which is exactly what the kids operating the drones are doing. Uh, that's number one. So the war has become part of the American culture. So you can't just talk about, oh, there is peace movement and peace activists, and we need to stop the government. I think, actually, that's very short-sighted. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, actually, there are now, what, 20% of Americans, 25% of Americans are working, and their livelihood is dependent on what used to be called the military industrial complex. I actually like to add to it now the military security industrial complex. Yeah. That's actually 20 to 25% of the Americans themselves. Yeah. That's number two. The, the third one uh, was uh, uh, when Robert Gates was picked by George Donkey Bush. I like to call him George Donkey Bush, not George W. Bush. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to become the Secretary of Defense. He actually, I wrote, I read the, his uh, memoirs, and he was so frustrated when he went to the Pentagon at the beginning that he was trying to talk to the military brass in the Pentagon about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they had no attention to him because they were actually thinking about the future wars. Like, the, the, to them, Iraq and Afghanistan was just a passing annoyance. They, they did not want really to talk to him. About, he, he was actually there to fix that mess. But they actually are more talking about the future. So another example of why I'm see, saying that war has become part of the American culture. And unless you start looking at it this way, you will not have much success. Well, I clearly failed uh, already dramatically in conveying my total agreement uh, w with the, the urgent need to take acceptance of war and love of war and passion for war out of US culture. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and if I suggested something otherwise, I did not intend it. But you didn't actually say anything. How, how to do that? How, can you guess what the age average of the people in this room is? 
yes, I, you know, I, I, I go and speak at colleges, I go and speak at events that have young people, I go and speak at events with wonderful peace organizations like these, and at every single one of those, including last night, and every single other one, uh, we address the fact that everybody is too old and too white and too rich, and, and it's true. Uh, but the people who are doing the most in this country for Palestinian rights right now are college students. Uh, and some of the people who are doing the most to oppose the, the drone wars uh, are young people, and some of them are former drone pilots. Um, so, you know, in terms of the U.S. culture being completely overwhelmed with devotion to war, and war having been completely normalized uh, so that everyone accepts it and uh, you're told that the troops should get on the airline first at every gate as I was yesterday because they need to be thanked for their service even though there's not a troop in sight and it's just normalized. Uh, I agree, but it's, it's, it's for the most part nothing new. Uh, and the U.S. revolution was a revolution to take the war west and kill the natives of this land. Uh, as was the Civil War. Uh, and once the land was conquered, there goes Hawaii and Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Philippines and on and on. War has been part of U.S. culture since before there was a United States. Um, in terms of the size of the military industrial complex, it is bigger than ever. Uh, it is capable of bigger than ever bribes uh, of the government, but it is not invincible and it is not uh, a force of nature it is a force of human creation that can be uncreated um i i actually can imagine you know it doesn't doesn't take anything but uh, a feat of imagination to imagine something i can imagine a united states uh without the war making uh, I know many people in the United States uh, who do everything they possibly can, including going to prison, to, to end the war making. Um, I, I think that when the movement developed to abolish slavery, uh, which yes, still needs to be completed, but has had incredible success, uh, the majority of human beings on earth were slaves and, had been, and that had been true for millennia. And anyone could come and stand up and say, I'm a realist and I can't imagine a world in which there's not a legal slave trade and legal plantation slavery. But, you know, that just takes imagination. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, it's good to understand what we're up against and that takes years of study. But to imagine a different world just takes kindergarten. You know, I mean, my kids can imagine a world without war. Uh, and I think we have to, you know, before women got the vote, you could say, you know, you could stand up and say women have never voted. I can't imagine a world in which women could vote. Uh, and by the way, they didn't vote themselves the right to vote. And the idea that you change anything by voting, uh, you know, I will quote a, a nice uh, woman activist, Emma Goldman, who said if voting ever changed anything, they would ban it. Uh, you, it, what, cha what changes things is precisely what this gentleman said, is changing the culture. Changing the culture so that it's acceptable to oppose war. So that big environmental groups that know that the military is the number one opponent of a healthy environment are willing to go against the flags and the music and the troops and oppose war. So that the 90% of corporations that would actually benefit from peace are willing to publicly say, as, as some of them have been moved to be willing to publicly say they're for gay rights or they're for net neutrality or they're for other things. Uh, we have to change the culture and that takes activism and education and agitation and all the thousand and one uh, tools of nonviolence. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That's what we have to do. Uh, thank you. I just have a uh, question. I haven't read your book yet. Um, as somebody who respects uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, I'm curious to know if your position is that he was a warmonger or that he took a uh, unnecessary approach to ending slavery. Um, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that you can. you can certainly... 
you can certainly forgive Abraham Lincoln for having known fairly little about Gandhi. You know, I mean, you, you, you can't blame people for not knowing things that hadn't happened yet. So there is that. Um, I think what Abraham Lincoln did to free the slaves in Washington, D.C., that little corner of, of the U.S. empire, he got exactly right. Uh, and, and of course, it sounds like madness to compensate the owners, you ought to be compensating the people who had been enslaved, but compensating the owners and freeing the slaves worked without violence in a lot of countries and in Washington, D.C. Uh, the southern states were not going to go for that. Uh, and, you know, there was, there was actually a last minute, last, uh, you know, ditch effort in Washington, a, a peace conference just before the Civil War, to try to avoid the Civil War. Uh, and uh, the, what it came down to was their perfect bipartisan harmony between the North and the South on the absolutely unquestioned need to grab lots of more territory going westward to the Pacific as, as the white race's responsibility. Uh, to the, the, the manifest destiny to benefit or destroy uh, the, the subhuman races and, and get to the Pacific. And then the, the inability of the North and the South to agree on making those new territories slave or free. Uh, and because they couldn't agree, the South wanted to leave and make its own country. Let it. Good riddance. Make your own country. No more no more uh, returning of escaped slaves to their owners. They escape, they're free. No more uh, economic cooperation with slavery, economic sanctions against slavery, international sanctions against slavery. No trade with countries that are ashamed of slavery. Uh, the economic pressures uh, applied, the moral pressures applied, the abolition movement continuing to grow in its uncompromised nonviolent form that was so uh, damaged by the Civil War. Uh, and, and the fact is that the Civil War wasn't just a bad way of ending slavery, it didn't end slavery. After a very brief reconstruction, slavery became quite predominant in the Deep South, and any black man knew that he could be arrested on nothing and be put into debt for the fees for being arrested and be put to work in a mine that was worse than slavery and be kept there in permanent debt slavery until he died. And that didn't end until World War II. And the resentment and the bitterness and the celebration of war in the former South shows no signs of ending yet. Right? You, you can't, you know, this is the difference between nonviolent solutions and violent solutions. The violent solutions don't actually end anything, and they create un, you know, unending bitterness and resentment and hatred. Uh, and, you know, and when you have the, the Atlanta Journal Constitution demanding that Japanese cities be burned exactly as Georgian cities were burned. Right, you know, some sort of strange displaced revenge. I mean, this is this is a symptom of war. This is what you get from war. Uh, I mean, if if the South had left and not come back, and we had two countries or three or four, uh, or Mexico still had its country, maybe give them that back. I mean, you might have a country with better representation. How many people routinely go from Seattle to Washington D.C. to protest? To, to exercise their right to bring grievances to the government, right? In London, Paris, Rome, everybody comes from the whole country, and, and they influence the government. In the, the United States is too big. And the rest of the United States, outside of the South, votes for peace and Bernie Sanders, by the way, although those are not necessarily equivalents. Uh, you know, I, I think that's, that Portions of countries, whether it's the Crimea or South Carolina, have the right to peacefully leave, and they should be allowed to leave. And it's, it's not, I'm not trying to be simplistic about allowing anybody to stay in slavery another moment, but the war didn't get them out of slavery, and it, it, you, didn't, you didn't have civil rights until you had a nonviolent movement in the 1960s. Uh, and... I, I think slavery could have been ended 
better, uh, which is not, you know, is not to put all the blame on Lincoln, but he was president and he would not allow a, a single uh, a, a single compromise of any sort with the South. Uh, there was going to be war. Was it, oh. Is it your impression from your studying that he uh, wouldn't allow them to secede because he wanted slavery to end, or he wouldn't allow them to secede because he wanted to expand America to the West? So my impression was that he was quite principled and wanted slavery to end, but I, honestly, I suspect you've done more research on this than myself. So. He said he was opposed to slavery, of course, uh, and you know we can take him at his word. Thomas Jefferson said he was opposed to slavery while buying more slaves. So some people you don't take at their word. Uh, the, the the thing about Lincoln though is he said that the South had every right to have slavery, and the federal government had absolutely no say in the matter. But if the South wanted slavery in any new territory, forget it. No way. Uh, and, and, you know, that was his position on what the law was, right? And that's why eventually the Emancipation Proclamation freed, you know, freed the slaves, you know, in the, in, in the places where he couldn't free them. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was after the war that, uh, that the legislation that's in the recent Lincoln movie was put through uh, that actually ended slavery, uh, legislation that could have been put through without a war. Now, you know, spread the brain around all sides, but if we want to end fossil fuel consumption, should we first go find some fields and kill each other in large numbers and then end fossil fuel consumption? Or should we just do the thing we want done, right? I mean, it's madness to first have a war. Uh, and, you know, if Lincoln, what Lincoln wanted was union. What Lincoln did was not ending slavery in the South, whether the South left or left or stayed. Lincoln wanted the Union preserved. He wanted the empire intact and expanded. Uh, and when the South said we're leaving, he said no, you can't. That was, you know, that was the war. Um, and around the middle of the war, Gettysburg, when people were getting kind of sick and tired of dying for the Union, which they didn't really appreciate all as much as Lincoln did. He said, actually, this is about ending slavery. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, yeah, we, we had a couple planes crash into some buildings. We got some questionable things crashed into the Pentagon in Pennsylvania. Uh, we got some radical draconian legislation, the Patriot Act, 17, what is 17 out of 18 Saudis, and we go to war with Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we're raining drones down on seven countries, probably hundreds of drones raining down. We're moving armored units into Eastern Europe, possibly the Ukraine. This is not provocative. This is not acts of war. Crashed in us, it's an act of war. We drop it on them, it's not, because we decide the rules. How do we stop them from doing that? Drones, is, drones are not benign, they'll kill you just as easily. Whether, you're, whether your head is cut off by a, by a saber or your body's blown apart by a drone, you're still dead. Well, I think the hypocrisy and the double standards yeah. that you're pointing to, which I imagine everyone agrees with, uh, is a key part of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that at some point, the law-abiding nations of the earth need to begin sanctioning the US government yeah. for its rogue criminal behavior. Yeah. Uh, and need to insist on its yeah. <clears throat> and need to insist yeah. on its membership yeah. in the International Criminal Court yeah. and its submission to the rule of law. Uh, and you know, until that happens, we're not going to have peace. Uh, the United Nations needs to be radically reformed or replaced. It needs to be democratized. Uh, you know, it can't be under the thumb of the United States. It's to the credit of Russia and China that after Libya, they said no on Syria, but yeah. why they had to, you know, why they had to learn from Libya is beyond me. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, that, that getting people to 
look at the United States from the outside for a minute, whether it means literally traveling abroad or just thinking abroad or talking to people abroad, uh, is is incredibly helpful. Um, there was in the in the last one of the last recent presidential campaign marathon madnesses, there was a, a, a Republican debate in South Carolina where Ron Paul was one of the candidates, uh, and he said, you know, I want to end this war and that war, and, you know, and there was lots of applause from at least part of the audience. Uh, and then he said, I think we should apply the golden rule to foreign policy and treat other nations the way we want this nation to be treated. And they booed him. The Republican primary debate audience booed Jesus Christ, yeah. right? Because he was talking about of treating other nations as equals, right? This is what people in the United States can't wrap their minds around, treating other nations as if they have rights, yeah. uh, as if, you know, President Obama talks about respecting sovereignty and only murdering people with missiles in nations where the government has okayed it or the exiled yeah. dictator has okayed it, yeah, except for, you know, where's the sovereignty for Libya or Syria or Iraq or, you know, but we, ought, we have to actually respect other nations and other, the United States has to sign on to all the wonderful human rights and anti-war treaties that it's a holdout on, you know? How many nations, how many nations have not signed the Convention on the Rights of the Child? How many nations do you think have not signed that? It was three recently. It is now one. There is one nation that does not think children should have any rights, that does not think laws should be shaped around protecting children, that, do, that thinks it's okay to give children life sentences without parole, that thinks it's okay to put children in adult prisons, that thinks it's okay to, to recruit children for the military. I mean, it, 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 at some point, we have to say that, you know, we, we have to recognize, Orwell made a couple of points. He said, people are going to excuse any sin if it's their nation doing it, and they're gonna show a remarkable ability to not even find out about it, right? So when Barack Obama in 2014 went to the New York Times and said, for my reelection, I would like you to make sure everyone knows that on Tuesdays I go through a list of men, women, and children and pick which ones to have murdered. And we went to Obama campaign events in 2014 to protest that, mm -hmm. and we couldn't find anybody who'd heard of it. If it was, a, it, First of all, if the drone victims were white, Obama would have been yeah. impeached. But if Obama were Republican, we would, we would have had, you know, the, the Arab Spring in, in Washington, D.C. I mean, we would have overthrown the government yeah. if Obama were a Republican and announced that policy in the New York Times. Um, so we have to get rid of the partisan hypocrisy as well as the national hypocrisy. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for mentioning Okinawa. I'm trying to build support for the city council here to do what they did in Berkeley and Cambridge, which is pass a resolution standing with the people of Okinawa who've been fighting for 20 years now to keep a new air base from being built over there. And one of the, one of the challenges, frankly, is that much of the peace movement is focused on the Mideast to the exclusion of the rest of the world. And uh, I think it's a huge mistake to ignore East Asia. Military budgets are rising all over the region. Japan, Japan's far-right government is, is eviscerating the peace constitution. Uh, our military is back in the Philippines 23 years after they, after they kicked us out. We're deliberately sailing warships close to islands claimed by China. And to be sure, that country and North Korea aren't helping matters. Counting us, that's three, count them, three states that have nuclear weapons. So I'm sure that we'll pay attention to East Asia if war breaks out there. But wouldn't it make more sense to pay some attention now while we still have an opportunity to prevent war from happening? 
Yes, it, it would make absolute sense. I, I couldn't agree more. It is where the big, biggest buildup of, of U.S. forces and U.S. bases uh, is happening and being attempted and in certain cases being blocked by incredible popular pressure and political success, as in Okinawa. Um, but it, it, it is a, a, an incredible struggle. Are, are you all familiar with, uh, with Japan's peace constitution that he mentioned? Everybody is? I mean, no. Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the big reasons why people around the world should be supporting the Japanese resistance to big new U.S. bases uh, is because Japan has had written into its constitution for 70 years a ban on war. Uh, and, you know, even though that was imposed uh, by a U.S. occupation, by the Korean War, the United States was telling Japan to, to scratch that out and ignore it, and Japan said, no, we like it, we're keeping it. And the same thing in the Vietnam War, and the same thing uh, in the Gulf War, and the Iraq War, but Japan started to, you know, slip a little bit. And, you know, somehow they, they claimed they were gonna f repair airplanes as their contribution to the coalition of the willing. So they were gonna fly airplanes that couldn't fly from Iraq to Japan to get fixed, you know, and then fly them back to Iraq to use them. And, uh, and now you have an administration in Japan that wants to reinterpret the Constitution so that black means white and peace means war. And this would, you know, this would be an incredible blow to you know, a country that has a culture of wanting to stay out of war and has appreciated that culture for all of these years. Um, so, you know, it, when the people of, of Japan and of Okinawa in particular are standing up and resisting, we got to be helping them in, in, with our Congress members in Washington, D.C., when we can go to Okinawa, uh, in, in global organizations, in, in city connections. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more. And, and to look ahead at where the wars are looming, namely with... China and Russia and still maybe Iran uh, is, is critical for the peace movement. Um, you know, Japan had gone for centuries without war and, and had flourished and the United States had encouraged imperialism and militarism in Iran, in Japan uh, and in particular one President Roosevelt had continued, uh, had promoted what came back to bite a different President Roosevelt. Uh, and for the United States to now be encouraging militarism in Japan, you know, ought to strike a good segment of the U.S. population as insane. I, I mean, World War II is the is the event in history, although it's mostly Europe, the European theater. It, it, but it's, but it, you know, Japan was part of, you know, the single biggest topic, as far as I can tell, of U.S. entertainment and and history. Uh, Americans ought to understand that it's that it's madness not to support peace in Japan. They've they've had the biggest peace rallies in Japan since the Vietnam War this year because of this effort to take peace away from them. So I, I agree with what you're saying. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. I've uh, really enjoyed everything I heard. You're, you're an inspiration, and same with all you guys. You guys are restoring my faith in humanity. Um, but you know, the only thing I, 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 I liked about Ronald, well, two things I liked about Ronald Reagan. One is hair, and, and, and two, the, the fact he consulted an astrologer. But no, I'm serious about that. Um, but um, my question for you is, can you debunk this whole idea that Reagan ended the Cold War with bringing us closer to mutually assured destruction? So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah. Can I debunk astrology first? Or... <laughs> okay, okay. But he did not dye his hair. He bleached his face. Uh, we... we... <laughs> You know, a part of a lot of what ended uh, the Cold War was uh, the Soviet Union's uh, 
spending on militarism, uh, which was insane, but it was not, that was not all that ended the Cold War. Uh, a lot of what ended the Cold War was disarmament and diplomacy uh, and openings between the Soviet Union under Gorbachev and, and the United States. Uh, and uh, the, the crazy thing uh, about the end of the Cold War is that whether people believed that militarism had been a big part of ending it or not, people believed that the United States had been waging all these wars around the world in Central America and everywhere else because of the communist Soviet Union and that that was all gonna end now and we were gonna get a peace dividend, which was just fundamentally wrong. The motivation for the wars since the, you know, since the, the slaughter of the Native Americans was domination of the earth. That was the motivation and it remained. And when communism vanished, they came up with an enemy that can't end, terrorism. And the wars are now fought against something that cannot go away. Uh, but the motivation, when you see the war, the war on terrorism predictably and knowingly increasing terrorism, the motivation is not to end terrorism any more than it was to end communism. The motivation is to dominate the earth and plunder the earth. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have to, we have to understand how, how cruel and insane and evil that is uh, if we're gonna go after it. Um, so I, 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 don't think, uh, I, I don't think Ronald Reagan, who refused to eliminate nuclear weapons uh, when Gorbachev was willing to go all the way on that, uh, is, is really a, a peace hero. Right, Star Wars was what Reagan would not give up on. Um, I think, you know, to see him as a peace hero is, you know, is a little bit crazy. Although I will say, if you go back and watch the debates between Reagan and Bush the first and, and other politicians of that era, and, and their talk about concern for Mexican workers and the need to expand rights for immigrants and all this sort of humanity that has just vanished. You, you get a real sense of the problem of lesser evilism, that when you choose the lesser evil candidate, next time around, both of them are more evil than the less evil candidate the time before. And you keep until you get to a point where going back and looking at Ronald Reagan, he seems, he seems like a, a, a really a, a sane, liberal person who would never consult an astrologist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask two questions, but um, Muhammad stole the first one from me, and you answered with um, maybe my face, favorite sentence that all peace activists should be repeating now and then, um, you have to change the culture. Um, so my, my first point, um, you're in Seattle and I'm a localist, um, so I'm going to make sure you leave knowing one more thing about Boeing. Um, they started down on Lake Union, right at the foot of Roanoke. Um, their first contract was with the Navy to build um, seaplanes for World War I. They never delivered any of them, but they got paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second point um, about changing the culture um, is about history. When I was a kid, um, an, an army kid in love with the army, I wanted to join it, um, and I got hooked on um, history. By third grade, I had read the entire shelf, and we, our school had an entire shelf of World War II books um, by third grade. Um, a little later on, I figured out that the reason there's an entire shelf about World War II is that history starts out being written by kings and generals. And kings are really just former generals. Um, since then, to my great delight, there's been a lot of other history written um, about things like agriculture and women and even history of music. Um, one thing that the peace movement has never done in any really effective way is tell its own history. 
Uh, for instance, you were just talking about the Cold War, and the Cold War ended. No, it didn't. The Cold War was won. Who were the victors? We were. We don't claim credit for our victories. The biggest, deadliest war ever was World War III. It was going to kill everybody. It's not even in the history books because we won it, and then we got all busy with stopping the F-18. We should have held a march down Main Street. We should have told everybody World War III is over because we won. When I say this to people in the peace movement, they say, there was no World War III. And I say, stop repeating what I just said. You said, and thank you, um, yes, there has been no war in Iran. No, that's not quite what happened. What happened was we won. We lost our effort to stop Bush from invading Iraq. But we won. He was going to invade Iran next, and Syria and, what, five or six other countries. So we won five out of six but we won't give ourselves credit for it. If we start letting people know more and more about how effective we are, about how many weapons we have stopped, about how many wars we have stopped, about how many lives we have saved, then people might believe um, that war is not the only answer. Well, I, well, I completely Agree, of course, uh, uh, and I think the point that people in the peace movement don't celebrate the victories because the corporate media, of course, doesn't celebrate the victories uh, is critical um, because people aren't even aware of the victories and people have internalized the idea of powerlessness so they tell themselves they didn't win. Now, it's possible to exaggerate your impact and to claim victories where you didn't win them, but uh, far more the problem is in the other direction. Um, and when people do write history of the peace movement, uh, they often point out uh, small victories that were won without being known at all by anybody, that were completely kept secret. Uh, so Lawrence Whitner is, is very good at this, uh, and he writes about asking the former White House staff uh, what they knew about the, the, the nuclear freeze campaign by activists. Uh, and after he's gotten the guy who ran the White House effort to monitor every single thing the freeze campaign was doing and sabotage it and so forth, uh, he asks uh, Ed Meese, another former staffer, uh, and he denies that the White House paid any attention to such nonsense until Whitner reveals what he already knows, and then Meese, you know, gets red-faced and admits it. They, you know, John, John Dean has admitted that Nixon assigned him to monitor everything the peace movement did. You know, they pretend not to pay any attention. Uh, when, uh, when Kennedy was deciding whether to resume nuclear testing because the Soviet Union was, and there were a handful of people protesting outside the White House, including uh, Whitner, he, he thought it was just silliness for decades until he found out in transcripts from White House conversations decades later that because of those few people shouting outside the White House, Kennedy had decided not to resume nuclear testing. If they had known that at the time, you know, they would have been back the next day with a thousand more people, right? But because, you know, the government hides the fact that it's paying very close attention to everything we do, uh, you know, people, pe people make themselves too powerless. I, I will say, though, uh, not to disagree with the ending of World War III, that enough nuclear weapons to destroy this planet many times over are still here. And the vast majority of them are still in the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and people are paying much less attention to that, which is much more dangerous than when they were very carefully guarding them. So, you know, we got we to gotta remember that that danger isn't gone. We have about seven more minutes left for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Why, why don't we take three questions and I'll... Okay, why don't we take... 
this question and those two questions uh, very fast, and I'll try to answer them all very fast. I'll try to make it short, but um, <laughs> I thank you for tonight. And uh, every time I do the anti-war movement, actually, I, I carry around the anti-war sign everywhere I go, but it's always uh, I'm kind of worried about you know the the soldier that already hurting, uh, especially the suicidal, uh, because the, the stronger slogan or like words I use uh, or demonize war is they get it, but uh, you know the, um, this government or you know uh, how do I say that? And uh, I I I try to be the Christian pacifist, and uh, especially I use the words um, kind of religious, anti-war. Um, it's very um, for the you know the, they have lots of soldier. It was Christian also, and it, um, it's really hurt them, uh, and I, I don't want, What's your question? Um, I don't want, I'm oh, sorry, I don't want, because of my anti-war, I don't want to push somebody off the cliff, or I, I don't want some, you know, kill somebody, you know, and I don't know how to separate, I mean, how to attack, or without hurting, uh, uh, Anyway, it just, um, you. Um, I'm sorry, I can't. Okay. Thank you. So earlier you said that war is about domination, and I agree. Um, my question for you is what is your stance on humanity's war on animals? So 56 billion animals are killed every year, and that's not including sea life. Probably over a trillion animals are killed every year for nothing more than human palate pleasure. We don't need them, we just enjoy eating them. I bring it up because Leo Tolstoy said, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. So I'm wondering if your peace and your compassion extends to all life on Earth or only humans? I agree with you that we, off, we, we need to end slaughtering animals and we need to end eating animals. I disagree with Tolstoy uh, that we can't end killing humans unless we end killing animals. I mean, you can end one evil without ending another one. Uh, we ought to end them all together. We can end, uh, I, I, I'm not sure we have time for any more questions, but uh, do we? We have about four minutes. Four minutes, okay, so very quickly, uh, you know, we can end war without ending racism. We can end war without ending capitalism. We should end all of these things together. Uh, and we'll be stronger as a movement if we do. Uh, and if we end killing humans and killing animals and destroying the environment, and as Dr. King said, racism and extreme materialism and militarism, uh, we're probably gonna do it as effectively as we can. But the fact is you can end one without ending the others. Um, you know, many countries have stopped committing war, but have not stopped slaughtering animals. I will say, though, that this past week, the Catholic Church has come darn close to agreeing with Tolstoy, finally, on the more central point, uh, that you cannot have such a thing as a good war or a just war. Uh, and President Obama's favorite philosopher, Thomas Aquinas, you know, is in the trash heap as far as uh, the Pope is concerned. And the Catholic Church is far out ahead of the US philosophy departments uh, at the universities and has decided there is not a just war and there cannot be a just war. And, and I... Are you vegan, like Dennis Kucinich, or would you consider being vegan? I'm the only woman that's asked a question. So can I ask one as the only woman? Yes. Ask how how does sexism answer. tie into war? Because usually they, they'll use a woman as an object um, to kind of provoke jealousy or they'll use a celebrity. Um, the women have to have certain measurements um, in, our, in our media. 
and our characters are kind of two-dimensional. So how does sexism play into war, um, the disregard for women and children? Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. So how, how would you? Uh, good question. Um, I have for a long time been vegetarian and I have more recently become mostly vegan, but not, not exclusively vegan, but I am uh, trying to move in the right direction while uh, eating airport food. And uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, again, we can end war without ending sexism, but we are going to have certain advantages if we learn from the thinking of feminist thinkers uh, in trying to end war. And we, of course, are going to find advantages in nations around the world from empowering women uh, and including women in general policies and peace negotiations and so forth. Um, you know, so you, you can't just elect a Margaret Thatcher as a token woman and do anything for peace. Uh, or another woman I can think of who's running for something. But, but you can... But if we don't end the twisted, perverse idea that it makes you a better man to back violence, then we're, then we're going to have a hard time. Uh, so we, we have to come to an understanding of women and men uh, that learns from feminism and rejects uh, the idea of manlyhood that comes from uh, supporting violence. That's all the time we have. Uh, the speaker will be signing books right behind me. And please join me in thanking the speaker. Be open.